All right. Welcome, everybody. Hello, my name is Lily. Hi, my name is Lauren. And welcome to the second annual Stockton Master of Science in Occupational Therapy White Coat Ceremony. We are so pleased to be here today to celebrate our accomplishments over the course of the past two years before we begin a new journey in our level two field work placements. We are so excited to be joined by our amazing professors, Dr. Rebecca Manel, Dr. Megan Fodi, Dr. Kimberly Furphy, our fieldwork coordinator, Sue Pullman Bernstein, our program director, Dr. Mary Kynes, the representative of academic affairs, Dr. Michelle McDonald, the Dean of Health Sciences, Dr. Peg Slusser, and our keynote speaker and Professor Emeritus, Dr. Victoria Schindler. We are also thankful for all of the guests who have joined us through the live stream, who have been a great support system throughout the didactic portion of our MSOT experience, and who have encouraged and believed in us through our struggles and doubts. We, we made, made it. it. Grad school was no easy feat, and we did it in the midst of a global pandemic. Through online learning and modified fieldwork placements, we learned the true essence of OT, to remain flexible, to modify and adapt, and to overcome any obstacle or limitations that stand in our way. And for that, I think we should begin with a round of applause for ourselves and our professors. Before we begin the ceremony, Lauren and I would like to look back and reminisce about our journey over the course of the past two years. When we thought about how we would present to all of you here today, we couldn't help but think about one thing our professors drilled in our head more than anything else. And that is a soap note. <laughs> For those of you joining our live stream, I think our class as a whole would describe a soap note as the utmost form of torture in writing. But really, soap notes are just a way to document our client's sessions, progress, and functional outcomes. It is broken down into a subjective section, objective section, assessment, and plan. Just to provide some background, subject subjective information is the information obtained from the client, giving their perspective on their condition or treatment. Objective information is where you record all measurable, quantifiable, and observable data that happened during the treatment session. Typically, this is the lengthiest section of the SOAP note. Assessment refers to the therapist's appraisal of the client's progress, occupational limitations, and expected benefit from occupational therapy intervention. A plan involves documenting the anticipated frequency and duration of the services and the specific interventions that will be used to achieve the client's goals. We thought, what better way to reminisce than to do so in the format of a SOAP note? And let me tell you, this was definitely the most difficult soap note to write. Subjective. When students were asked to sum up graduate school using a few words, they reported, and I quote, the most challenging fun I would never want to have again, <laughs> massive debt, faking it till I make it, can't tell if I have free time or I'm just procrastinating, difficult yet fulfilling, a time to make great friends, an opportunity to learn and to prepare for my future, and my personal favorite, okay, good, as quoted by Kimberly Furphy. <laughs> Objective. Cohort participated in a two-year skilled occupational therapy program in West Quad rooms 203 and 208 to perfect the art of treatment planning, case studies, practicals, and final exams. Occupational therapists Becky, Mary, Kim, Megan, Vicki, Andrea, and Joe provided skilled instruction in all things OT. Semester one, students demonstrated competency in the summer anatomy course, although 29 out of 29 students still require max verbal cues to remember the bones in the hand. <laughs> <laughs> students demonstrated an understanding of OT pioneers, physical and mental health diagnoses, motor performance, and the group process. Students demonstrated improvements in social skills, evidenced by group lunches in the amphitheater outside of West Quad, and increased participation in group activities and projects. 29 out of 29 students shed a minimum of 10 tears during the LTA assignment. Nevertheless, all students remembered one key fact. 
proximal stability for distal mobility. Semester two, students demonstrated competency in pediatric OT through hands-on activities, including swinging on swings, rolling in mats, spinning on discs, and crawling through mazes. Cohort as a whole is sensory seeking as seen through increased participation in lectures, level one fieldwork and events, including preschool observations, baby day and tailor care presentations. Students required max A and at least 100 verbal cues to accomplish the high stakes pediatric case study. Additionally, 15 out of 29 students required zones of regulation to accomplish the task. Unfortunately, student roles, routines, and performance patterns were disrupted upon the initiation of the COVID-19 pandemic, which resulted in the start of virtual learning and Zoom classes. Semester three, students learned adaptive and compensatory strategies to excel in hybrid learning. OTs and cohort navigated through the depths of the online world, learning how to utilize breakout rooms, virtual backgrounds, online waiting rooms, and flip grids. Despite the negative implications of online learning, students developed adaptive coping techniques through group me memes and superfluous amounts of wine drinking. In in-person classes, students mastered the art of independently donning PPE, including gowns, gloves, and foggy face shields. In doing so, students were able to participate in wheelchair activities, explore various assistive technologies, and attend hand therapy labs. Cohort engaged in their first in-person practical, reporting a numerical pain scale score of 10 out of 10 while studying goniometry and manual muscle testing. Despite the challenges, students maintained a strong and wide base of support to excel academically. Semester four, cohort as a whole demonstrated increased clinical reasoning, knowledge, and expertise in regard to the older adult population. Students partook in various learning experiences through skills for success, professional issues, and clinical research. Students were also able to fabricate seven out of seven splints with 100% accuracy. Student vitals were monitored pre and post SimLab final, practical. Pre-practical -pac vitals, heart rate, 137 beats per minute. Respiration rate, 28 breaths per minute. Blood pressure, 180 over 100. <laughs> Indicative of tachycardia, hypertension, and dyspnea secondary to stress, fear, and anxiety. Post-practical vitals, heart rate, 65 beats per minute. Respiration rate, 12 breaths per minute. Blood pressure, 110 over 70. Indicative of post-practical relief and success. Through level one field work, students establish relationships with community older adult peers and practice on the spot learning through competency evaluations. Although students rated this semester a 20 on the Borg rate of perceived excursion, they excelled with two pieces of advice. One, Remain positive. It's always up with the good and down with the bad. Two, reach for your dreams, but not too far, or you'll break 90 degrees. Assessment. Students still present with functional limitations in the clinical provision of occupational therapy services to individuals across the lifespan in various settings. However, through hard work and countless hours of studying, cohort as a whole has established a strong knowledge base in physical, psychosocial, and cognitive evaluations and interventions in the pediatric, adult, and older adult populations. OTs have seen tremendous gains in students' flexibility, knowledge, and skills since the beginning of the program. Students have been active participants during the two-year Skilled Occupational Therapy Program, increasing their likelihood to reach short-term and long-term goals and be competent and skilled entry-level occupational, therapy, occupational therapists by discharge. Students would benefit from continued school, skilled OT to continue building competency through level two fieldwork. Plan. Students to be seen for a duration of 40 hours a week for 24 weeks to establish the skills necessary to become a registered occupational therapist. Future sessions will include independently evaluating and treating clients in a caseload, creating client-centered treatment plans and activities, and running facility and services. Short-term goal one, ACE level two field work. Short-term goal two, pass the NBCOT certification exam. 
Short-term goal three, become skilled occupational therapy clinicians in our chosen respective disciplines. Long-term goal, achieve a personal state of occupational balance, perceive, preserve friendships with MSOT colleagues and faculty, and improve the quality of life and well-being in the lives of our clients. While this is the conclusion of our soap note, this marks the beginning of the next chapter in our lives. I have full confidence that we will all achieve our goals and succeed in any field we wish to pursue within occupational therapy. We thank you for going down memory lane and reminiscing with us. Thank you so much. At this point, we would like to pass the mic to Representative of Academic Affairs, Dr. Michelle McDonald. Good afternoon. On behalf of Stockton University's President Harvey Kesselman and Provost Susan Davenport, it's my pleasure to congratulate the students participating in today's white coat ceremony. This is a proud moment for all of you, and it's a proud moment for your faculty, your family, and your friends who may be joining us remotely, and of course, for your institution. You've worked hard to get where you are and are exemplars of how Stockton's occupational therapy program fulfills its mission to help our students become competent and caring practitioners and lifelong learners. The white coat that you are about to receive is a tangible reminder of this commitment. It's a time-honored tradition, and in some ways, this ceremony will be more meaningful, I understand, than your school's commencement ceremony, though I really hope that many of you are planning to join us in May um, when we bring all of our graduates, of course, together. Not this year, of course, this year, but they will not be all together. They will be distributed among 12 ceremonies over three days, or what we affectionately call our commencement marathon. Yeah, I know, I know, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But those ceremonies are institutional celebrations, and this afternoon signifies your official initiation into your chosen profession. I have seen the profound impact that occupational therapists can have in the lives of their patients firsthand. Seven years ago, my mother had a stroke, and then another, and then another. And each time she felt her world, her ability to do daily things that made up her life, shrink. She had an excellent support team, including an occupational therapist who helped her not only regain mobility, but also develop strategies for how to pace her activities in what was her new normal, how to care for herself, how to care for her home. I remember her OT saying, we'll have you up and about before you know it, walking your dog, caring for your things, cooking your meals, at which point my mother stopped and kind of gave me a sideline look and I hastened to assure her that she would not be responsible for cooking meals because she and her kitchen had a very long-standing arrangement. They tried to stay as far away from each other as possible. It was really best for everyone involved. But these people, because I should say her occupational therapist and for you, her, 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 um, your kissing cousins and communication disorders, she had an excellent speech therapist. These people were so important to her that she remained in contact with them for years after her sessions ended, and they spoke about her resilience at her memorial service two years ago. Your career, your calling, is about so much more than helping people regain physical control over their bodies. It's about building capacity and independence. It's about reigniting people's sense of self. I wish you the very best of luck as you begin this new phase of your life. I have confidence that the faculty and staff who have helped you get to this place are proud of what you've accomplished and of what you will accomplish moving forward. You are caregivers to be sure, but you're also leaders and future leaders of the institutions that will employ you among the colleagues of your profession and in the communities in which you work and reside. Thank you for undertaking this important work and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Michelle McDonald. Next, we have the Dean of Health Sciences, Dr. Peg Slusser. All right, here I am in disguise. <laughs> Greetings, um, Dr. McDonald, Dr. Kuntz, faculty colleagues, students, honored guests, families, 
friends watching us from afar. It's an honor to add my, on, my welcoming address to you, and I guarantee it will be really short. You're going to put on that long-awaited and hard-earned white coat. You've reached another milestone in preparing for this profession that you've dedicated yourselves to. But let's think about it. It didn't happen quite like you and your faculty planned. It's interesting how things happened. This journey has been full of surprises. The biggest ones your classmates already mentioned was COVID-19 and a global pandemic. Who planned for that? That's not what we signed up for, none of us. It changed things. It changed things, but your goal didn't. Your faculty's goal didn't. And you're still on your path. That's really something. You should be really proud of what you've accomplished. You, your family, your faculty, you've all demonstrated an amazing level of adaptability, patience, trust, and determination in navigating this constantly changing path to get to where you're going. But today you're here at your white coat ceremony. You've learned a valuable lesson. You kept your eye on your goal and you were willing to explore new paths to get there. You were patient and persistent. Take that lesson with you as you go through life and approach your other goals. Things don't always happen the way we think they're going to happen, but keep your eye on the goal. Today, this is a touchstone to becoming an occupational therapist. Your white coat symbolizes the transition from classroom to clinic, and you are ready. It's a symbol of the immense honor that you will claim as members of this profession. It's not given to everybody. You know lots of people want to be occupational therapists. You will be occupational therapists. It's also a symbol of the trust and respect you're going to receive every day in every unique therapist-patient relationship that you have the honor of participating in. I hope you'll always remember that determination and flexibility that it took to reach your goal, and that you will always be flexible and patient in exploring all of the varied paths that are out there to help those you serve reach those therapeutic goals that you're going to be setting with those entrusted to your care. It's a great lesson, and you definitely have nailed it. So congratulations. Wear your white coat with pride. You've earned it. Get out there and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peg Slusser. Next, we are going to hear a few words from our director, our program director, Dr. Mary Kent. <laughs> All right, hi everybody. Um, so the one thing, the first thing I have to say is, um, as I was sitting there finishing my speech this morning. I kind of thought of all of you <laughs> and having uh, timelines and deadlines. Um, wasn't because of procrastination, just because of all the work that we've been having to do, but uh, put me in the mindset back of, of being a student and having things done. Um, so I do want to say it's wonderful to see all of you in clothes other than sweats and leggings um, and dressed up and hair done and makeup on. Um, so this is a big day for all of you. Um, as Dr. Slusser said, this symbolizes your completion of your classwork. Um, didn't we all tell you how quick this was going to be? Um, you know, we still remember when you first came in two years ago and that first semester and I just said, you know, you're going to work hard but it's going to be over before you know it. Um, didn't feel like it during it, I'm sure, but now that you're here, you're like, wow, where did that time go? 
Um, you really have taken an average of 18 credits a semester. You've been active members of SOTA. You've planned and, and coordinated community service projects. You've gave sizable donations with fundraising money to an orphanage in Columbia and to the Ark of Atlantic to help support a family um, that has a family member with IDD. You've worked part-time and some of you full-time jobs while also maintaining a full-time credit load. Um, many of you have worked on campus, including graduate assistantships, resident assistantships, and admission ambassadors. And on top of all of that, you've volunteered your time with various projects that we've presented to you, including working with older adults and individuals with autism in the community. I'm tired just thinking about it. <laughs> um, so you are the class that COVID-19 hit the hardest, but I thought it was important for you to think about the things that were positives of virtual and hybrid learning. Um, the first is you got to roll out of bed at 8.50 in the morning to be online by 8.55. Um, you got to stay in your sweats and pajamas or bathrobes, as some people, no names, Amory. Um, you didn't have to worry about parking when you did come to campus. Um, you got to have your own support animal, i.e. your pet, with you at all times. And I also think that we all got to know each other a little better since we let each other into our homes through Zoom, particularly getting to know Megan's children. <laughs> um, I always say that that as a cohort your cohort becomes like your family because there are times in this program that you see your classmates more than your family and your friends um, and like siblings you like each other most of the time and you irritate each other some of the other times um, but through it all you've supported each other through difficult times like loss of family members but you've also celebrated really happy times such as engagements and marriages so you will all become colleagues in a few short months in this wonderful field of OT, and I hope that you continue to foster the friendships and relationships that you've developed over these two years. So on behalf of the faculty, I want to congratulate you on achieving this milestone in the program. We know that your journey through this program was different because of COVID, but it wasn't worse. It was different. So we know that you have all the skills and all the knowledge that you need to be able to do great in field work and to go on and become great OT practitioners. So I wanna encourage you to finish the semester strong because you're not done yet, <laughs> um, but then go out strong to field work and make us proud as we know you, that you will. Thank you, Dr. Mary Kentz. Next, we have our keynote speaker and professor emeritus, Dr. Victoria Schindler. Class of 2021, I am so happy to see you. Welcome to your families, friends, and loved ones too who I know are participating through live stream. I'm so happy to see the MSOT faculty and also Dr. McDonald and Dr. Slusser who are here with us today. Congratulations to the class and to everyone else here in person and virtual for all of your support. MSOT students, it is certainly no easy feat to get to this point in general Never mind all the additional challenges of the pandemic. As many of you know, I have been an OT for a long time, since 1983. There have been many changes since that time that have impacted our education, our profession, and our lives. For example, when I graduated, not only were there no cell phones, there were no computers. And my car was a horse and buggy. <laughs> makes it sound like that <laughs> but nothing compares to this pandemic in my 40 years of practice nothing compares to this pandemic for me this pandemic came at the end of my full-time career but for you it's at the start of your career and not only did you survive it you completed a highly competitive homework exam case study and field work packed full-time master's program. I'm sure there were a lot of frustrations and disappointments along the way. Zoom overload, field work changes, unable to go to Columbia. But despite it all, you are here now. You made it. 
wow. Talk about resilience. Talk about growth, development, and learning. Amazing. You definitely have what it takes to have a successful career and to move our profession forward. I started to write this speech shortly after I received the invitation. However, after attending the alumni event Thursday evening, I can see that some of my thoughts echo the experiences and words of wisdom of the alumni on the panel. That is my hope and my wish for you is that you take care of yourself, especially your mental health. As you start your career and take our profession to the next generation. Taking care of yourself will give you the daily strength you need to take care of others and to manage the ever-changing healthcare system and to enjoy the journey. Many years ago, I had one of many opportunities to explain what we do to someone who had no idea about OT. I gave what we call the elevator speech. We work with people of all ages and all diagnoses to help them do what is meaningful to them by focusing on their strengths and addressing their challenges. In response, the person said, oh, you're problem solvers. I never heard of us described that way before, but it's true. Being problem solvers is a very good thing. It means you help people with things that are important and meaningful to them. Our MSOT program ensures that you are well prepared to do this. You will have many instances of helping people to successfully solve their problems. However, it could also mean that problems become our focus. This can create negativity and pessimism. Let me give you an example. You have just created a treatment plan so creative, so innovative, and so comprehensive that Eleanor Clark Slagle would be jealous. <laughs> the students know her name, but for those of you who don't, she was one of the founders of our profession. So you present your treatment plan to your client or your client's family, and the response is, not in so many words, but maybe through resistance, no thank you. Maybe you had this experience and skills for success. Now, instead of going to a dark place, such as what is wrong with them, or what is wrong with me, can you take a step back and take a more curious, concerned, but also detached look at it? Well, isn't this interesting? And then continue with your problem solving. We also can keep in mind that many of our clients have had very difficult life experience that have resulted in their referral to therapy, experiences that we will never have. There is a lot we can learn from them, even if it is through their denial, resistance, or seemingly lack of motivation. You and I didn't spend much time together, really just the group process course. However, your level of investment in that course really struck me. I can remember in particular our class on cognitive behavioral therapy and our discussion about our human propensity to negative thinking. You were astute about it then and the need to change it. And the fact that you are all here now, after all of the negativity and worry that surrounded this pandemic, is a testament to your resilience. So I challenge you, when some of those 80,000 thoughts we have as humans per day get us down or pessimistic, can you change the O in OT to optimistic therapy? After surviving a, pro, a pandemic in this very rigorous program, I not only think you can, I know you can. By now, you are probably experts in knowing that we learn more from the difficulties than the smooth sailing. To have this kind of attitude, which I'm still working on after all these years, you need to take care of yourself. Create the life balance we teach. Plan for positive rest and relaxation in whatever way suits your style. Check in with yourself. 
I have a reminder on my phone that sounds periodically throughout the day. At those times, I try to remember to ask myself, am I in a positive place? Is my body feeling relaxed? If not, what do I need to do to bring myself to a more positive place? Also, develop your supports. Not necessarily the people you work with, but those who share a specialty area with you where you can keep the focus on learning and being curious about the problems you're facing. You will be in a much better position to help others and to enjoy the journey. Of the 40 years of OTs who have graduated since me, I would argue that you, this group right here, right now, through this pandemic, has had a unique experience like no other that can lead to a level of resilience that will boost your own mental health throughout your career. Don't ever forget this start to your career. You not only survived, but you thrived in a pandemic and you came out on the other side. You nailed it. You got this. So congratulations and Godspeed. Okay, so before I um, announce any names, I'd like to apologize to the families and friends um, for how I'm going to butcher some of these last names. I did practice them last night over a bottle of wine, which was probably not the best decision. Um, but at least it wasn't my usual drink of choice, which is bourbon. So I might have some of them okay. All right, so here we go. And I start with the hardest one. All right. Uh, Anne Marie Afrosinia. <laughs> A. Afrosinia. Ah, I got it. <laughs> Hold on, Anne Marie. Put it on. Samantha Barcia. Lily Lillian Blostein. Erica Bruno. Nick Chakran and his Carolina Blue shoes. <laughs> Shannon Dixon. Faith Madden. We'll just go backwards. <laughs> Melissa Mabel. Rachel Lucia.
Jessica Luca. Alani Lee. <laughs> Kelsey Kasavage. Sally Elias. Annie Eisenman. Amanda Sheets. Mary Shanna says. Sierra Sage. <laughs> Kelsey Rune. Chelsea Roof. <laughs> Paul Poliviu. Tara Pettit. Claudia Patron. Carly Vettiri.
Ali Tomowski. Lauren Sutphin. Gabby Sorrentino. Nicole Sicarella. And a shout out to your classmates who couldn't be here today, both Caitlin Curley and Rebecca Zillis. Before we end the ceremony, we would like to honor all of our professors and speakers and express our gratitude. Dr. Janet Bonney, Dr. Joseph Basante, and Dr. Andrea Garcia were unable to make it to the ceremony today. Can we please give a round of applause for all of them? Next, we will call you up ooh, one by one and request you come up to the stage so we can give you a round of applause. Dr. Michelle McDonald. All right. Dr. Peg Slusser. Dr. Mary Kent. Okay. It's Wendy. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Victoria Schindler. Dr. Megan Fody. Dr. Rebecca Manel. Dr. Kimberly Furphy. Mrs. Sue Pullman Bernstein. And Mrs. Priscilla Cunningham. Thank you so much for playing so beautifully. <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone who came to join us on this special day. We want to give a special thanks to all of our speakers, our wonderful piano player, Ms. Priscilla Cunningham, our classmate, Allison Tomowski, who helped us prepare 
the goodie bags for everyone. And of course, Dr. Megan Fodi, our professor and GA supervisor who trusted us with organizing this ceremony. <laughs> and most of all, thank you to our friends and family who are watching us through the live stream. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for all of you. Thank you. Before we end, I'd like to thank the event services for coordinating the live stream. You did an amazing job having our friends and family be here today, even though they couldn't be here in person. We thank you all so much for being here. Give, give yourselves a round of applause. We're here. We're almost done. One case study, one practical, three exams. We got it. <laughs>